all right i had to come back and i had to record an actual video to be uploaded i know it's probably gonna take forever but um what happens when it gets to that point and you know this this is actually what happens when people don't um address a uh, reconciliation in the appropriate way that means that y'all never went deep with it y'all have never really um had that vulnerable moment where y'all actually explored how this really affected each other to the point where we uprooted it together in the spirit and in the love of God because I'm looking out for you as my sister's keeper so that just when I say that discussion or that conversation needs to be had I'm not talking about like any surface level superficial conversation about it and we just had this general understanding that whatever you know transpired wasn't a father and you know the apology is given it's like well that's nice that you were humble enough to apologize and there's some peaceful you know um closure as far as you know the dialogue itself but what happens with that is because y'all didn't really do it the way scripture really wants you to do it which is the revelation i'm giving in this message going deep with each other exchanging that pain and you know sharing in this uh in that oneness of how this actually affected that other sister um, it doesn't matter how many conversations it takes or how long it has to take because y'all didn't do that. It's basically just going to be offenses on top of offenses on top of offenses. And y'all probably had little bitty apologies and moved forward with some uh, nice branches on the tree. But in reality, you never forgave that person. And I'm going to tell you, when some, when sometimes when people are saying stuff, there's no way you can just jump over the energy that was discerned. What was communicated in spirit when somebody was saying certain things about you? She meant what she said. That's honestly how she feels about you. You know, scripture says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, it's very true that our hearts can be deceived. Our hearts are deceitful and wicked. So any heart that is accusing and judgmental uh, against anybody is, is not the heart of God. That is something that needs to be corrected. That's a blinder that that person has on them, which is why they can't walk in the love of God towards you. They can't even follow proper protocol with how he says to do something. So, but it, it's still, the point is... Um, The idea that somebody can disrespect you and disrespect your feelings and your humanity and literally crush you as a fellow believer, and they're supposed to be one too. You've disrespected my entire person through slander or whatever it was, and you think that if you just came and apologized, I'm going to tell you right now, I, I had someone, I had somebody do this recently, <laughs> a few months ago, um... I'm not going to say who the trash bag was that did it. I'm going to just let y'all figure that out for yourselves. This person emailed me. And to be honest, I didn't even know who it was at first. But I got this like a paragraph of an email and they just kind of went into, hey, you know, I'm sorry for the way I treated you. And, you know, I wasn't in a good mental headspace at the time. And um, they had the nerve to say, I don't condone people treating people like that. It, it was <laughs> the narcissism behind that. It's like, it's just like, that was just an, it's an odd term to use when you said you don't condone this being done. Like you weren't the one that actually did these things. It was like a weird dissociative, like apology. It just didn't make any sense. And I didn't even read the whole thing. I didn't even know who I was talking to. And then like I kept asking the person, I'm like, who is this? And it was them. And, you know, that this was their attempted apology. And I, I said, yeah, just delete my contact <laughs> information. Like, I, I wasn't trying to have anything. Because, like I said, a true apology, and we know this, when you come and apologize to Father, Father don't want no apology from you. He wants repentance. How many times do we go to God and say sorry and just keep doing the same thing over and over again? Why would I value apology when a true apology actually encompasses or consists of repentance? 
behavior change, heart change, actually. You actually becoming intimate with the awareness of what you actually did and how bad it really was. This is something that you need to come to a place of deep understanding about so that you don't do it again. So when this is like repetitive behavior and you just keep getting apologies, it's, it's, not, it's not deeply rooted. Even if the person is genuine, it, it needs to be a, it's a deeper situation that needs to be addressed a, a lot more deeply. So, um, I have had those encounters with, uh, with some sisters where I can honestly say not only was, and this is not me being pet, pet, petty or bitter, how I feel about whoever I've dealt with is between me and that person and between me and the Lord. But I, I just wanted to kind of use this as an example because I have had those situations where I've tried to open that door for, um, the Holy Spirit to work in that space by opening and initiating that dialogue so there could be true reconciliation. I even brought up how the other person may have felt, you know, throughout these uh, numerous offenses. And I never got that returned back to me. As, an, as a matter of fact, I never actually got an apology from them. And you have to be careful with that. Because definitely be obedient to God. Definitely do what Father told you to do, you know. You be spiritually mature and you do apologize if that's what needs to be done on your part. You know, you definitely uh, make reparations on your end if you did transgress against this believer. But when it's just you that's going out of your way to take accountability for what you did. And as far as uh, acknowledging how it may have affected this person and how it probably made them feel to the point where you're just kind of condemning yourself and they're not giving that to you. They're not taking accountability for anything. This person is not truly humble in heart to really come down to that level of vulnerability with you to actually explore that same energy with you for them to even discern and examine themselves with what they did, how that may have affected you and how that made you feel. So, be careful with that, <laughs> okay? And um, I was going to say in my last video, this actually is why Jesus said, if you gain your brother, because he knows everybody's heart is not submitted to God. There are some tears amongst us who have not yet been exposed because it's not Father's timing. If you gain your brother, y'all will be reconciled. The relationship will be restored. But he did say, if they still don't repent even after that, now we bring this issue to the church. Because the idea is, since we are all a corporate, collective unit as the body of Christ, moving towards the same purpose and the same goal, which is Father's heart and his desire for his kingdom, they're, they're now, um, now what's required to be a little bit more supervision with this situation. Now we got to get other witnesses, two or three witnesses involved in this. It's really sad if it comes to that point. And then he says, even after that, and I've, I've, I've done this before. I want to say that with the actual person I'm thinking about, I actually did do this. What happened in that situation when I did things biblically, it did not work between the two of us alone. So I did get other sisters as witnesses to the fellowship itself to kind of um, supervise and to just what I was I was hoping to kind of be discerning in the spirit of God, holding all of us accountable to what the father uh, expects us to be and expects us to do. They treated the entire situation like it was a joke. They were so blinded by their own pride. They were so blinded by their own personal, uh, they just kind of let the enemy just kind of come in and I guess just mess with their perception of me or whatever was going on with that. It probably was more than likely just a heart issue on their part. They couldn't even respect father enough to submit themselves to the situation that was going on when the other sisters were involved to actually have a mature conversation and genuinely deal with these matters in the spirit of God. They were treating it like it was a joke, very nasty spirit, kind of mocking, 
type of, uh, it was, it was disgusting to be honest with you. But this is why my point is, this is why Jesus says after that, if they still didn't really humble themselves and they didn't really do what's required of them and they showed you another fruit, he says, treat that brother or that sister like a heathen or a publican. Because by that point, they have proven themselves, at least in this season, to not be somebody that's really in the spirit of God. You're, you would be delusional to move forward and to think that they are if that's how they treated a situation that Father encourages us to initiate to deal with something the way he wants it done for his purpose. Can you imagine being at a council meeting where Father is at the end of the table and there's an issue that needs to be resolved. And at this point, it's not even just you and the other individual anymore. Now there's other entities that had to come into this situation, which I think that's really, really sad. But anyway, that's how Jesus says it should be done. Could you imagine this person treating a meeting that the Father's presence is at himself? And you know, this is actually why scripture tells you to get two or more witnesses involved. Because remember, he tells you, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am in the midst. So she couldn't even respect the presence of God enough to humble herself and be mature about a situation where Father has ordained certain relationships, her being a part of one of these relationships. She's very much aware of what his will and his plan is when it comes to this relationship. But she wasn't humble enough in heart or spirit to respect his presence that he clearly said was there. Because it's multiple believers at this point. She didn't respect the Holy Spirit or fear him enough to even treat it like a serious matter. This has actually happened. This has occurred actually multiple times with the same person. That sister was exposing her spirit. I don't care what anybody says, you know, and Jesus, uh, when it comes to stuff like that, you know, when you have scriptures about, you know, encouraging us to love each other and things like that, a lot of that stuff is really encouraged because that really can't be exercised within the actual body of believers unless they're already submitted to the Holy Spirit. But with the wicked believers, you notice Jesus always says to just kind of remove them from the fellowship. Like uh, 1 Corinthians, cast that wicked man from, uh, from among you. Like kick him out the congregation. He's clearly not submitted to the government of God. Or if this brother still doesn't receive correction and you've gotten multiple believers on this same matter and they just kind of, there was like no repentance, no real respect or fear for father really shown to handle this the way he said to. He says, treat that brother or sister like a heathen or a publican. They're not submitted to him. That's not your sister. There's something else going on in there that needs to be. Um, when she decides to actually submit to the Holy Spirit, <laughs> you know, so. But anyway. So I guess just kind of going back to my original point, the beginning of the uh, the message. Um, When you truly handle reconciliation the way scripture encourages you to, when you realize that you have to get invested deeply into how this truly affected this other believer, and you realize that you got to get your hands dirty because you have to rebuild what you tore down in this person, or take some part in assisting the Holy Spirit in rebuilding the sister back up. This Father encourages you to love to this capacity as you love yourself. And by participating in that rebuilding and that restoring of not just the fellowship, but the, the person. You definitely killed something in them. I can assure you of that. Whatever father was working on building up in them, your pettiness, your immaturity, your lack of fear of God, your ugly fruit, whatever it what spirit, whatever it was tore that down in that sister. So it's personal now. Now you're messing with God's handiwork. 
when you really get invested and you realize that it takes this level of investment to really reconcile the way father truly tells you to, you will be very careful with offending anybody else moving forward. And that's actually what the, that's his intention behind it. I want you to see the work that has to go into this to fix what you messed up so that you stop doing it. Once again, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, love intentionally on purpose. <laughs> okay. So, um, I hope that that kind of just like covers, um, just, just what I was really just thinking about when I started this message of when it comes to Jesus's instructions to forgive repetitively, um, always being ready to forgive each other. A lot of these instructions and these commandments, I don't think, and I think Father knows this, I don't think these things are instantaneous. I think he knows, especially him being a God of love, and he talks about cultivating fruit all the time. Love has to be exercised. Like love is a skill that has to be developed. Love has to be cultivated. And when you have scripture telling you to walk in love or to function in love, labor in love, this means that I'm investing in working at something. So it kind of goes without saying that if he's telling you to forgive somebody and he's encouraging y'all to forgive each other, that within that, you know, same um, domain of forgiveness and walking in love with each other is common sense that that requires a lot of uh, vulnerability and um, really another scripture that comes to mind is how scripture tells us to carry one another's burdens. So that, that kind of really aligns with the tone of my message that I did tonight. Um, and in the sense of just humbling yourself and just coming down to meet this sister or this brother, the party that is offended where they're at, and to really hear them out and how your actions have, have affected them. And you need to be humble enough to realize that, yes, this is something that you were actually capable of, and you did this. You're not righteous the way you think you are. You know? So, um, bearing one another's burdens, laboring in love, for you to walk in love and forgive the way he tells you to, you have to cultivate love and these kind of things have to be done on the daily in the church. You got to care that much because if you don't care, that's selfishness and that's witchcraft and you can't love God. He says, how can you love me if you don't even love your brother? You can't even cultivate and labor in love with your brother, but you love me? That doesn't make any sense. So the relationships that we have with each other in the body of Christ, this really kind of supersedes like uh, any friendship. I mean, you know, that dimension of relationship is a blessing from the Lord, you know, friendships and romantic relationships and, you know, God ordained husband and wife and courtship, all that stuff, you know, all that stuff is a blessing. But in reality, your relationships uh, really do super that that supersedes father's plan and his overall, you know, scheme. It, it supersedes that stuff. The point is, is that if we are not aligned with one another spiritually, in heart and in soul, if we can't even respect each other to that level to where we care about the entire inner man of each other, there will not be any success. There will not be any unity in the body of Christ in the, in the realm of the spirit when it comes to what actually needs to be manifested here and what God's trying to do. You are hindering that big time with you letting the enemy come in to display and manifest this unfruitful character and treatment of your brothers and sisters in Christ, whether a spirit is using you or not, it needs to be cast out. 100%. You can't disrespect somebody as a sister or a brother. Disrespect their anointing 
that God has placed upon them that they wear as a mantle. Mock them, cuss them out, call them names, and just expect them to just forgive you. As if this did not affect them on any on any level, to any capacity, as a person. Discrediting someone's entire humanity just because they have the Holy Spirit. That is sociopathic thinking. That's crazy. Because what that does, that's teaching other believers to be sociopaths and narcissists as well. Because you are promoting the idea that it's okay to abuse and mistreat anybody in the body of Christ. As long as we apologize to each other after, we have an understanding that we have an obligation to for, to forgive. You have to forgive me. Could you imagine being raped by somebody? And then after they're done raping you, they look you in your face on top of you and say, you have to forgive me. God says you have to forgive me. I just raped you. I just caused you probably decades of emotional and psychological trauma. It's going to screw you up internally for the rest of your life. And I've caused you physical pain as well. But you have to forgive me because God said to. What that type of attitude and belief does in the body of Christ, it takes away your personal responsibility to be held accountable for what you did. So I apologize to every believer out there who was probably made to believe that God supports or encourages any of his people treating you the way they have treated you. If you have never gotten the proper apology that you deserve, that is not how God functions. You have some wicked people who don't know their God, who are not submitted to him, don't know his ways. Just like he says in scripture, these are, um, I forgot what he called the Israelites, a silly, simple people. They don't know their God. They don't even know my ways. Ignorant people, I apologize if you have experienced this to any to any capacity with any person who's a professed believer that have yet to make themselves accountable to you, to make genuine reconciliation with you, to explain themselves and to give a a reasonable explanation for the way they spoke to with or about you, the way they made you feel and they have just trotted off into the the poppies with Dorothy thinking they will continue a healthy relationship with God when they did you wrong and you are still battling this offense in your heart. I can assure you the Holy Spirit is dealing with that person. That's not how God moves. That's not how he operates. That's not what he tells us to do. Experiencing that from many believers will make you believe that that's how God operates, and it's really not. It will make you feel like he does not validate your feelings, and that's not true. God does care about how you're treated. He does care about your heart. He does care about how you are treated as a person and how you feel as a human being. He's not invalidating your rights as an individual. You have a right to not be raped. You have a right to not be abused. Now, he may tell you to respond in a different way. That does not mean that he's invalidating your rights. Because guess what? If he were invalidating your rights, he wouldn't deal with the matter in terms of judgment on those people. He just says, let me deal with it. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. But he cares about how you're treated, for sure. He's a righteous and a just God. He can't not care. For a God to tell you to abound in love towards the same people that you're yoked to through the same spirit. To carry their burdens, to truly become one with them. For the same God to say, love your neighbor as you love yourself. You mean, what? when you think about the idea of loving yourself, you would have to really know yourself intimately in every um Every compartment, everything, everything that, you know, that you're made up of, your soul, your spirit, you know, your desires, your traumas, you would have to really know yourself and become intimately acquainted with yourself to really love yourself properly. God is saying you should do that with others, too. That's work. That's why I say when you when you see scriptures talking about love and labor and love and cultivating love, there's work that goes into this. You just have people that don't want to do the work. They just want to be religious. 
I want to have an appearance of godliness. I don't actually really want to care about you. Because the truth is, I really don't care about you. I don't really want to have to explore how this actually made Brandy feel. I don't want to hear about your traumas and how your life is being affected, Brandy. Because I don't care. That's not love. Because if you don't care about this person's well-being as an individual who is a part of the very kingdom that you're working for, this, this is hindering Father's entire craftsmanship as a whole. What the purpose he even set this up for. So you don't even care about him. This is why I said this supersedes the personal relationship between you and this believer. This is about the kingdom. Like, get over yourself, <laughs> you know? This is just a, a, a method that he's given us on how to deal with these issues and to labor in love. You have to be willing to do the work so that we can keep the enemy out of us through offense and bitterness and stuff. We can't have that in us. And I want to say this, you know, um, kind of jumping off of the whole idea of <sighs> damaged relationships being repaired and being restored in Christ. And now that we've learned what that actually takes to do that and why sometimes it doesn't get repaired, it's just pride. Like I said, there's one or more parties that aren't really trying to be submitted to the Holy Spirit because they don't really care about the benefit of the kingdom. So that's why they're still petty. They're still immature. All that stuff is still in them. These are not people that submitted to God. Okay, they're not. We're not going to argue that. But I also wanted to kind of jump on, you know, when you think about it, how, how, how are we going to feel comfortable Coming to our own brotherhood, the saints, how are we going to feel comfortable coming to other believers? Making ourselves vulnerable to other believers. And, you know, I, the kingdom, the church is supposed to be a safe haven to us. This is where you come when you need healing. This is where you come for love. This is where you come when you want a sister and a friend and a companionship. And you're trusting that this person loves Jesus. How so, so you see how far the dysfunction actually spreads just because one person isn't submitted to the Holy Spirit. That's all it takes is one, one bad apple. You see how everything just gets thrown off balance because now whatever is in you that's not aligned with the Spirit of God is going to affect me. So now this place has been so corrupted, I'm not even comfortable coming here for restoration, for peace, for healing, for deliverance, for companionship, for comfort. I can't even trust my own brethren. It's like we're a part of the same house, we're a part of you know, we're a part of the nation of Israel, but who here is really serving Yah? Nobody. Now that's not fair to the body of Christ. I mean, who else are we supposed to turn to but each other? We can't go to the world. They surely don't have the love of God to give us. <laughs> they, the only thing they can offer you is uh, partial love and uh, superficial, shallow, whatever they have. It's not genuine. Because the kind of love that it takes to really manifest and channel the love of God or be used as a conduit for the love of God itself it takes self-sacrifice as a fellow sister and a fellow brother to give yourself over, to pour out of yourself and to get invested, get in deep, get your hands dirty and care and, you know, carry one another's burdens. Become one with this sister. Love her as you love yourself. You need that kind of godly love to be a true spiritual shield for believers in the spirit realm. The world cannot give you that. All they care about is themselves. They, they don't even, they're not able to. You need the Holy Spirit just to do that. We just choose not to. We have, we have it in us to do it. We just choose not to submit to him. That's a choice. I know the father has to get tired of us like
do y'all not realize that when you destroy each other, leave this sister broken, feelings hurt, damaged, beyond repair, you're affecting the the roof and the very foundation of your your corp your house corporately in general that is the body of Christ you're breaking everything down you break her you break yourself treat people like you actually value them treat it like it's actually a, a valuable item and appreciate it cuz it's the roof over your head the church is Oh, God. Lord, help us, please. Oh, Jesus. And you know, I used to say, you know, there's a part of me as a sister. I, I, I say this all the time that I'm still looking for that love. Or I've never really met a believer who just really genuinely had the love of God in them to give to me. Because I need a lot of healing as a sister. But now I'm learning that, well, Brandy, you can exercise and cultivate that love with your other sisters together. It's not about finding someone who has it perfectly down and perfectly mature because this is the same love that he tells you to abound in through exercise to get with the people you already have fellowship with. Y'all can give that to each other. You don't have to go to some deliverance minister and some pastor and somebody that's really deeply meaty and seasoned. And I mean, that would probably be a blessing if somebody's mature and, you know, they're not uh, immature and, you know, yielding to their flesh and just treating you any kind of way, of course. But, you know, you have relationships and this is for y'all as well. You guys already have certain believers that you're in fellowship with. And if we learn through this message how Father actually wants us to love or how we should actually go about Walking in that love and understanding via revelation how to do that. Well, you can do that with the people that you have now. You know, abound in this same love with the people that you have now. Do it with them. This is how we strengthen each other. Once we get skilled and we're exercising the love of God and we become more accustomed to it, we're putting it into practice um, becomes a practice it becomes more common to give ourselves and to carry one another bur another's burdens and to you know put ourselves aside and care more about our brother or sister put them before ourselves when you put that into practice continually that's how you abound in the love of God that's five believers just just imagine if those five sisters just just did that just five let's just say it's just five people and they worked at that corporately. That's five strong, spiritually mature saints that made the body of Christ the billion.